recording so that I can upload this afterwards. And get back here. Uh, I don't know if that's showing up correctly. Okay, there we go. Welcome everybody to the second call in the Unity 3D concept to completion. My name's Ernest Loveland. I'm a technical evangelist intern from Microsoft South Africa. And apparently this is going to just keep closing. So I'm going to run through it like this, just for ease. Uh, just a reminder about where you can get in touch and where you can find more information. So my social media and blog are at the same place. Um, ErnestLoveland.co.za um, The Facebook group is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash MIA, which is MEA Game Champs. And slides and recordings will be posted to the group after each call. So we're currently in the, the second session on schedule for doing 2D in Unity. And uh, I just want to remind you guys, you're encouraged to ask questions. So I'm hoping that you guys have uh, at least taken some time to get hold of Unity 3D and install it so that after today's call, you can start using it. And just a, a shout out, this weekend coming up is the Global Game Jam. And if you want to, you can go find jam sites that are in your country and take part. And this will be a great opportunity for you to try out some of the things that you learn and probably learn a lot more things about game development. So firstly, before we t uh, hop into Unity, we're going to have to talk about a few things. The first thing is the coordinate systems. So I'm hoping that everybody is familiar with the Cartesian plane. Basically, it can be seen as a grid with x and y coordinates, and in this case, we'll also consider the fact that there's z or depth coordinates. But each of these points will make up how we position things on our screen. So just remember whenever you get stuck that these things we talk about reference back to the Cartesian plane. So we're going to use the, these coordinates a lot, especially when we find and place objects. And we're also going to use them a lot when we need to work out certain things like positioning. Um, one thing that we need to note is for ease, we're going to use the center of the sprite for their origin, which basically means our object's position will be represented by its center point. Uh, it's just for ease. You can change which point on the object itself is the origin, but using the center often makes it easier to understand how rotation and such is going to work. So another important thing to know is sprite pixels don't translate directly to Cartesian units in the Unity editor. So when we set up sprites, which are basically 2D images, we are going to set what is called their pixels to units. And as an example, the default is 100 pixels equal to one unit. So just, just to take a look over here, this 100 pixels over here is exactly one unit. So we have a one unit by one unit square, which is a 100 by 100 pixel sprite. So I just thought I'd clarify that. So if we're going to move on quickly, just to take a quick look. In the coordinate systems in Unity, there are three main different areas where we'll look at coordinates. The first thing is all of our game objects will reside in the world. Now, what this means is our objects will move from certain points in the world to other points in the world. And this has uh, an effect on objects when you look at the depth of them, as well as the x and y coordinates. So your x, y, and z all affect where they are placed in this world. And in the world, your positive y axis goes up, and your positive x, uh, x axis goes to the right. Now on the screen, we have the same y-axis going upwards and the x-axis going to the right, but it is important to note that your screen doesn't change, pos uh, change position when the world changes position. So if we move the camera in the world, uh, we can't use the exact screen coordinates to work out where objects are. And lastly, if we take a look at the, the GUI, 
or graphical user interface tools in Unity, which we will touch on today. Uh, the x-axis is to the right, positive, and positive y goes downwards. Now, this specifically has the origin, which is the 0, 0, 0 point at the top left of the screen for the GUI. So when we place things on the screen, that's, the, that's where we'll reference for the top left. And the important thing to know is when we convert a world to screen coordinate, uh, for saying, for say, overlaying text in front of an object, we're going to need to swap our Y values to be able to show it on the correct place on our GUI. So I talked about converting these coordinates. These functions all take place under the camera.main in our scripting, and we'll show an example of it later. But there are two sets of functions that we'll use. So the first is screen to world. So that'll take a coordinate on the screen, and if we use mouse input specifically, we'll get the mouse position in screen coordinates. So we can get the world coordinates from that. And then the other option is to use the world to screen function. And that'll take a world coordinate and return where that coordinate is represented on the screen space. And if we want to find this coordinate in GUI space, we will use the world to screen function, but we'll transform the the value that we get back out using the rule uh, x stays the same, z stays the same, but our y becomes the height of the screen minus the y value we get back. Uh, it could be quite difficult to remember, but just you'll be able to come back and check this at a later stage. Let's see, is there a question? Okay, so the screen space is the whole space that uh, you have from the top left corner of the game window to the bottom right corner of the game window. But the coordinate for when they reference things on the screen is different to the coordinates that the GUI uses when it draws. So it, it it's the same physical area that we look at, but it's a different actual coordinate system. Does that make sense? I'll just wait for the people typing. Okay. So, okay, let me, I'll go through the coordinates again. So let's just head back over here. First things first, on this Cartesian plane, so let me zoom in here. Okay. This object here being at 0 0.5, 0 0.50 0, means I am at halfway through one of these units. But what I've done is I've set the pixels for this sprite. So this is this is some kind of player character or that kind of thing. And I've set that its sprite object, the number of pixels, uh, its width and its height, should be used as a single unit in the game world. So in this case, a single unit should be 100 pixels. So 100 pixels worth of sprite fits in a, a, a one unit area. Okay? Then if we take a look at the coordinates, so I'm going to zoom in here some more. The world, this is where my little objects are. So I've got a player over here in my world drawing. He's at zero, zero. Now if I wanted to work out where his position in the world is on the screen, I'd need to convert it to a screen coordinate. And that'll give me the position on screen. And this would, for instance, if I was at 640 by 480, be 320 by 240, right? Which is exactly in the middle, which is something we'd expect. If we were to use this for the GUI coordinates, this would be the same, but the problem comes in is if we move the player upwards in uh, these coordinates, we will get a screen point over here. And this is an increase in Y. So because it's a, it's a, a, the Y increase goes upwards, this would maybe be 420, okay? But this would be a downwards move in the GUI space because downwards is positive in GUI space. Does that make sense? That's the only difference between the, the screen area and the GUI area. All right. Awesome. So I'm going to move on then. So just some of the things that we're going to start using very often, especially when we build actual games, is it's important to note that we can tag objects. So when we're searching for different objects, we are going to tag them and we're going to use game object. 
uh, dot find game object or game object so you can get multiple objects by tag so the second thing to note is when we move things there are three important properties we're going to use and these are under game objects there's the transforms position rotation and scale and just as an added note if we do collisions we're probably going to need to do conversions between different coordinate systems so you should just note that so I'm going to switch over to the Unity editor and if you do have questions and I don't notice the, the message notification uh, you feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt but we're going to get started on 2D so the first important thing when we're working in Unity is to understand that the 2D assets can be many different image types and we don't have to have single images or multiple images, these are all handled within the Unity editor. So we're going to cover this first. So I have a bunch of images here and I'm just going to show them to you. So I've got a player sprite sheet here. These are all Creative Commons zero attribution uh, artworks that I've gotten from various places. And when I put the video on YouTube, I'll link to the actual origins of the sprites so you can get them for yourself if you want. This is something that we're going to cut up and we're going to show some simple sprite animations with. Then I've got another even smaller sprite which is a dragon skeleton of sorts which is from another pack and then I've got these platform metal sprite sheet. And these are the the things that I'm going to use as a base for the, the 2D tutorial going forward. So I'm going to just grab all of these quickly and drag them into my project and immediately they're available in Unity. I'm going to also, while I'm at it, just reorganize my, uh, from the start, organize all my things just in a way that I like it. So I'm going to put these in a sprites folder. So if you take a look at these textures, there's nothing much that's particularly special about them at this point. It's just 2D images. But there is a specific problem that we need to deal with. If I go game object, create other, and then sprite. Uh, and we have our new sprite here. If I try to set the sprite from our assets, you'll see we see nothing. So there's two things that we need to do. The first of which is we need to select all of our sprites and we need to change the texture type in our inspector to sprite. And then just deselect them and it'll ask you to apply the settings. And you'll see immediately we have, if you look in the preview, we have alpha channels. So we've got parts of the sprites that are see-through. And if we go back to that new sprite, we can select these. Obviously, we don't want the whole player sprite sheet as our sprite, though. So we're going to take a look at one more thing before we look at splitting these sprites up. So if I move over here to my ske uh, skeletal dragon, and I'm going to make that the sprite for that object. Now, this skeletal dragon, the current uh, setting is 100 pixels is 100 units. But if you take a look here, let me zoom in, the image is 32 by 32. And I want everything, regardless of whatever size it is, to fit in one unit for ease. So I'm going to change my pixels to units here in the inspector to 32. All right. So if I change that property on the, the sprite and apply the settings change, you'll see the sprite immediately got bigger. And this means each one of these single unit distances, so that's what the, the grid is currently showing here in Unity, is the same distance as my sprite. So this is just for ease. And you'll find when working on your own projects that if you work to a consistent scale for your object, it becomes easier. So now we're going to take a look at the sprite editor. So here I'm going to specifically change my pixels to units to 70. And this is just because of how big these sprites are. So these sprites are 70 high. They're slightly different width and height. But we're now going to change it into multiple sprites. So we're going to use it as an actual sprite sheet. So over here in our inspector, 
the first thing we need to take a look at is there is a sprite mode and you'll see it set to single. We're going to change this to multiple and an object, a property will come up, sprite editor. And this sprite editor is what we're going to use to chop up our sprite. So if we open the sprite editor, you'll see it shows us our whole sprite. All we need to do at this point is start clicking and dragging to add in different sprites. I'm going to just quickly get myself three of these. So there's one, two, and three. And you can resize these afterwards. So you don't have to worry about it being perfect. You can always just resize it to make things exactly what you want. And I'm just checking that the center is the same pixel. And then you click Apply. Now, if I go back to my sprite here, I'm just going to set it to one of the sprites. What we're going to do now is we're going to quickly make a new prefab with this. So I'm going to call this, I'm going to rename it. So I just press F2 and I'm going to call it player and I'm going to make my first prefab for this session. So I'm just, I like putting things in prefab folder and sprite folders. It just makes my organization work better. I've dragged it in and now I can change the player object to my liking. So what we're going to do at this point is we're going to make a simple animation. So to do this, there are two main ways that we can do this. And the simplest way that we're going to do is we're going to select our object in the world. We're going to go window and we're going to go animation. And all we have to do is say create a new clip. And I'm going to go back out here, make a folder in asset and I'm going to call it animations and I'm going to call it player walk animation. Okay. So in my player and walk animation I now need to start adding animations. So I've docked my animation editor over here. Uh, yours might be a floating widow but you do not need to worry about that. You can see here when I've clicked add curve I've gotten a few options. So I have transform, sprite renderer, and animator. So any kind of component with properties or any built-in components that have been added, so I've got the transform, sprite render, and animator can be changed. So I'm going to do a sprite animation, so I'm going to go add curve, sprite renderer, sprite. So you'll see here's the sprite option. I'm just going to click the plus and it'll add sprite. So this is quite simple and easy to use and you can also do it with the the transforms, so position, rotation, and scale, and these are important things. So you'll see here, I have a very simple timeline, and you'll notice it goes from zero to 60 for a single unit. This is not 60 seconds, however, this is 60 frames per second. So these are in number of frames. Now, my walk animation is very simple. So I'm going to go to 20 and I'm going to right click and add a frame or add an animation event is wrong. Here we go. I'm going to add a key and at 40 I'm going to add another key. So this is very simple and very easy to do. And now if I go to this particular sprite instance, I can go to my inspector, change the sprite to the second walk animation sprite and do the same for the next piece. And if I click play, you can see I have a very simple but badly cut walking sprite. I'm going to leave that like that for now. My object now has a sprite. So if I uh, it has an animation. So I can run this and it'll just keep running through the animation. Now obviously, if we're not walking the player around, we don't necessarily want it to animate. So I'm going to just make one more animation. So I'm making a second animation here, so a new clip, and we're going back to assets, animations, player, idle, animation, and I'm just going to add a curve, sprite renderer, sprite, and I'm going to leave it completely blank so that if it's playing this exact animation, it's not going to change anything. So I'm just quickly saving my scene and I'm going to call this game scene. I hope everything has been clear till now. 
Um, if you need me to repeat things, please be sure to let me know. So now that we've created two animations, we're going to take a look at how to change between these animations. So what we're going to do is on our object over here, we're going to add an animation component. So I just went add component and searched for animation. And the first thing we need is a default animation. So I'm going to set the default to player idle animation. And I'm going to set the number of animations to two. And two, there we go. And set the animation clip. So I want to make sure it has the idle animation and that it has the walk animation. And now we're going to start taking a look at scripts. So I'm just going to create my scripts folder quickly and make one for the player. So let's make a C sharp script animation manager. I should probably call it something more explicit like player animation manager, but for now this will probably do. So what these two animations that we have made are called is animation clips. And the important thing for us as game developers is we're going to work with these clips by their names. So I gave them very descriptive names so that it's very easy for us to check which of the, the animations either we're playing or we want to show to the user. And I'm just struggling with my laptop at the moment. So we'll be ready in a moment. Are there any questions at the moment? While Visual Studio launches. Is everything all right, Christian? I see Mono behavior is Unity based in Mono. Uh, sort of. So Unity uses the the Mono engine for compiling its C sharp script. This is why it's able to be cross platform. So I use Visual Studio as my editor, but this is by choice. With many people, they just use Mono Develop. And the important thing to note is some things that work in Visual Studio and won't give you issues with their IntelliSense might not run in Mono, which means the Unity editor, when it compiles your script, might show errors that Visual Studio doesn't. Um, you can just use Mono Develop if you prefer. So we're going to jump into the script quickly. I'm going to do two major things. I'm going to add myself a private int current clip and call it zero. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this slightly differently. I'm just going to start off with a time till the next animation. So public float time till next is equals to three. Let's just see what that message is. Awesome. So time till next is equal to three. So what I'm going to do is something very simple. I'm going to decrease this every frame that this is updated by the amount of time, which is delta time since the last update. And I'm going to say, if the time until next is less than or equal to zero, we want to change animations. OK, so I'm going to, when I do this, increase my time till next by three seconds. So every three seconds, it's going to alternate. And we'll come back and change this animation code later. But for now, what we're going to say is, if animation dot clip dot name is equal to player idle animation, we're going to go animation dot play, and we're just going to say play the player walk animation. Right, it's very, very simple. Otherwise, we're going to play the idle animation. So I'm just going to copy paste this quickly and change that to idle. 
So if we go back here and we go to our prefabs, so in Unity I'm going to my prefabs when Unity wakes up. On my player, I'm going to add a component and I'm going to add that animation manager. So hopefully if everything went all right and I run this, it's going to do the walk animation and then the idle animation. Player walk could not be played because it could not be found. Please pl attach the player walk animation. I think what I forgot to do is add these animations to the player object, to the correct player object. So this should have these animations attached. Time to next three. And I'm going to remove that quickly. Okay, here we go. We've got our idle animation, but it's still shouting about the walk animation. Um, I had issues with this yesterday, and I'm just trying to think of how I fixed it. But what I will do is I'll show you another method for adding animations, which will also work, but that doesn't change the sprites. So there's two types of animations in Unity. The first type is the ones that are able to change sprites using the sprite manager, which is which, I, which is what I just showed. And the second type is called legacy animation. And legacy animation can't change sprites. So first things first, what I'm going to do is get rid of these animations. And I'm going to go back to my prefabs quickly. I'm going to remove the animation component and from this player I'm going to... okay that's all good. So if I go back to the player now I'm going to start from scratch by adding animation. I just did this to remove any object references. So if I add this animation and I go directly to my animation editor if I click the, the record button. So you see over here that record button, it's going to ask me to save the clip. So I'm going to go animations and I'm going to say player walk animation. Okay, and in this case, even if I set the sprite renderer, I'm going to show you now. So sprite renderer sprite, I can add in my keyframes. So there we go. And there we go, and change my sprite. So this is going to be player sprite sheet 1, and that's going to be player sprite sheet 2. So now I should have a walk animation. You'll see it's not animating. So this is what we call a legacy animation, the way that we created it this time. And these animations have slightly bigger ad, uh, limitations, but I'm going to show you that this does still work partially. So I'm going to add rotation, and under my rotation I'm going to just change the Z value. So I'm going to rotate around the Z axis. So I'm going to go minus 15, and then over here I'm going to go plus 15. So if I play this now, you'll see it's going to do a, a little wobble as he's walking, not that he's animating his sprite. So I clicked off the red record button and I'm just going to add my other animation and this one is player idle animation and I will post about how to fix the issue with sprite as soon as I remember how it was done um, at a later stage but I'm sorry that I can't help with it right now so I'm going to add in the rotation again actually let's not do rotation let's just do a bit of scale for a change and we're going to change the Y scale and we're going to go like so and we're going to say 1.1 and here we're going to go 1.1. So when he's idling he's going to do some sort of breathing thing. Okay, so did I save that? Okay, so the default animation that we're going to go for is the idle animation. So if I run this, he should sit and do some sort of little breathing thing for three seconds. Then he's going to do that little bobbing thing. 
for three seconds. It's very, very simple to do and easy to do in your own applications. And there are many other properties that you can add and control. Uh, if you add in components, so you'll see here my animation manager, you can uh, change the properties that it has. So if I just add the animation manager quickly for showing, there's only one property on it. So you'll see I've got the three. That was the default value for time till next. And I can animate it. But we won't do that for now. So let's remove that property and save that. I hope everything has been clear up to now. So now what we're going to look at is object tagging. So inside the inspector, for an object that we have, so you'll do this on a prefab, otherwise it won't happen to all the objects, you have a tag property. Now this is very important for us to do things like controlling players. So what we're going to first look at is adding tags. So if I go to that tag property to the drop down list, there are a few built in properties. There's untagged, respawn, finish, editor only, main camera, player, and game controller. And right at the bottom, there's an option add tag. And often what you're going to work with is the add tag property. So because there's a player tag, I'm going to tag my player as uh, a player. And that was silly of me because I didn't do it on the actual prefab, but there we go. Now, if I need to get hold of the player in script, I can use that game object dot get uh, get game object with tag. So we're going to take a look at that at the moment. I'm going to do this very very badly. So I'm going to make a separate player controller, and I'm going to add a component to it which is a new script, and I'm going to call it player control script. And I can set the language here, so you can see I'm just using C sharp. Uh, I wish I didn't lose my changes, player control script, and create it and add it. So if we go back to Visual Studio and reload, yes, we will have a new player control script. So let me just zoom in so it's easier for you to see. So in the update, which is where we're going to do any game logic that we want to do, the first thing we're going to do is check if we're receiving any input. So first things first, if input.get mouse button, and we're going to use zero, so the first mouse button, so zero, one, and two are your options. If we're pushing down the mouse button, we want to move the player. So this is going to just be done very simply. We're going to say var players equal to game object dot find game object with tag, and we're going to use the tag player. And with this player object that we get in response, we're going to say player dot transform dot translate. So this is how we move things around in the world as we use the translate function. And we're going to give it a vector three. So I'm going to add a new, use a new vector three, and I'm going to not move in the y direction. I'm just going to go move four float, and our y direction will be zero, and our z direction will be zero, and I'm going to times this by time dot delta time. So this is every second I want to move four units in the Unity editor. So if we go back here, our player controller is in the world. If I click, you'll see my player moves to the right. This isn't obviously exactly what we want, but it will serve our purposes. So now I've got this animation manager code. I'm going to comment out all of it, and we're going to add in some of this animation handling to our player control script. So if the mouse is clicked, it should move to the right. So animation.play, and we're going to say we want to play the player idle animation. OK, and in here, when we're moving the player, we want to play the animation. Is 
the player walk animation. There are some small problems that we can fix right now. And one of those problems is the fact that we don't need to set the animation every single frame. So we're going to say bool was walking is equal to false. And else if was walking. Okay. So if it was walking, play the idle animation and was walking is false. And here, if not was walking, we'll play the animation, play walk animation, and we'll set was walking to true. This is very simple, and all it'll do is say, as soon as we start walking, we're going to start playing the walk animation. As soon as we stop walking, we're going to play the idle animation. So let's just go back and see this change in Unity. As long as we're standing still, our little player is going to do the idle animation. And I didn't set the animation to loop, so we'll go back and change that just now. But if I click, Unity will freeze. Sorry, please bear with me. Are there any questions so far? There we go. So if I click, it should have been playing that animation. There is no animation attached to the player controller game object, but the script is trying to access it. And let's just look here. There is an animation component and there are animations. That's not right. Let's just check. Um, player idle, player walk. But it's only showing a single animation here. So let's just go back to our animation. And that looks wrong. Let's just go through adding these again quickly for the purpose of showing this exercise. Let's reset it. Actually, let's just remove and add animation. Okay, so what we were doing was recording player idle animation. We'll leave it just like that. A new clip. Play a walk animation. I'm going to change it to position this time. Y will be 0 0.1. Am I selecting the player controller? I am. That's wrong. That's very wrong. Okay. Play a walk. And player idle. I may have selected the wrong object earlier. So idle, I'm going to leave the same. And walk, I'm going to change. So walk, just do that transform. 0 0.1, 0, 0.1, 0. 0 0.1. All right. If I play that, it should look like a little hopping thing, and that's fine. If we go back here, on here we have to set idle as the default, and we should have our animations. Okay, let's just check. He's not doing anything. So it's having issues with the animation component. It's probably because I'm not using player.animation. All errors have to be fixed. Player doesn't exist in the current context. Okay. All errors should be fixed. And it doesn't look like we're playing. But if I hold in, it plays the animation, and then it moves. 
Um, there are some things that uh, do need to be considered. And because I was changing the transform in the animation to 0, 0, so if we go back to our animation here, the position over here was set to 0, 0. What I need to do is remove the keys from properties that I need to change. So in this case, x is the one that's important. I'll be able to move and animate. So you need to just make sure, and that didn't work, you need to just make sure that you have the correct things in your animations and not unnecessary things that you might need to change. So I'm going to move forward so I can get some other things done as part of this session. But what I've shown is uh, making simple objects that use tags and controlling objects from script. So I could have done this on the player object itself, but to show you that I could get the player object with a game, uh, the player game object with a tag, we did it from another object. So I'm going to keep this code like this for now, but I'm going to change this to the get key down. I'm going to just use get key rather and key code dot d because it was to the right and leave it like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to add in another method of input. So I'm going to show you quickly the screen to world coordinate and another thing that I didn't mention earlier which is the screen to ray. So if I use the mouse for input, so input.get mouse button and we're going to use zero again. So if I left click, what I want the player to do is I want to move the player towards where the mouse is in the world. So let's get hold of the player. What we need to do is get the world coordinate for the mouse. So very nice function is we're going to say world pause is camera dot main. So we want the main camera for the scene and we want to use a screen point to world point. Screen to world point and the position that we give it is the input dot mouse position. And here we're going to very very simply go player dot transform dot translate and we're going to say the world position of the 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 mouse minus the player's transform dot position and we'll probably have a session where we cover a lot of this mathematics for people that aren't uh, very clued up with vector math but all I'm doing is working out the direction from the player position to the world position so the difference between the two positions that would have to be made up and I'm going to multiply this by delta time so this isn't a very accurate measure. What you'd probably want to do is normalize this vector, so make it a length of 1, and multiply it by the distance that you actually want to move. But if we go back into the game now and run it, if I click, you'll see it's coming towards the world. So there's a very, very simple bug that comes from using the screen to world point. When I click over here, in this top left corner of the screen, I'm not getting the position on the zero plane. So here in the world, let me just switch off the 2D view, if I move around over here, when I click on the screen, okay, let me just zoom in here, when I click on the screen, so just imagine that this is the screen where the camera is looking from, when I click in this top left corner, this is the point that I'm getting. So when I move towards that position, that is why the player moves closer in. So he's, his z-coordinate is becoming closer to the z-coordinate of the camera. Now, the way, the, one of the ways to combat this is what we can do is change this world position to array. So I'm going to use screen point to array. 
and it uses the mouse position and we're going to get the point and before I forget to do this I'm going to move this ray to its own thing and you'll see why now so we'll make a ray and we're going to use the ray dot get point and the distance that we want is the ray dot origin dot z but the negative of it so the screen is at a negative z coordinate so we'll just use the point the same distance that the ray starts from the origin uh, which is the zero on z and this will give us the coordinate that we actually want in the world so if we go back to unity and give this game a quick run so if I click over here instead of moving closer it's now moving to the actual world coordinate so you'll probably end up using the the ray method at some point for moving your character or finding where you're clicking the next thing that we're going to do is call a function with or without arguments on another object so on the player I'm going to add some scripts quickly so let's go over here to script and add in a player script let's do a C sharp script call me and if we go to our prefabs to the player prefab what we can do here is add this call me function or script rather and let's quickly make the function that we want so here what I want to do is in call me I want to add another function so let's just call the function call me for ease and we'll first do it without a parameter so if this function is called what we're going to do is set a string so we're gonna have a string not called we're gonna set that string to let's call it value I'm gonna zoom in quickly just see what the question is the same thing we can do by keys is by getting the get key function so instead of clicking we can use a key yeah so if you look back at the the player control script and I scroll back up here you see I've got this line here I switched it to get key so now if I press the key B it'll play that animation uh, do those other things that I had before I just changed it from mouse to get key which is a keyboard code so that I could use the mouse button for the moving around because it makes more sense converting a screen coordinate to a world coordinate if you've clicked on something okay so I've got string value not called and I'm just going to change the value here to called and I will talk more about the unity GUI shortly but I'm going to add a void on GUI just so I can show you this value on the screen so GUI dot text area and zero zero hundred hundred and the text is going to be value so if I'm able to call this function from somewhere else the text will change on the screen so I'm gonna go back here call me cannot be the na same name as the type so I'm gonna call this call me function okay. let's run that again so we can actually see what's happening so you'll see here in the top left I've got this text that just says not called now we're going to change that so now I'm switching back to my player control script and I've got the player object here already when I click so when I do this I'm going to go player dot send message and I give it a method name so I called it call me function and now when I click the mouse on the screen anywhere it's going to call that function so let's just go back here and I just want to prove this so you can see it's still on not called so I click and the player moves and immediately it changed to called so this is how we're going to be able to send object messages from other objects this is very useful for object interaction 
So using tags, we can find the objects we need to send messages to, and then we can call functions on those objects. But I did mention that what we can do is we can give parameters. So I'm going to change this call me function, and it's going to take a vector 3 v, and our value is going to become v dot two string. And if we head back to our player control script, when we send it a message, we just add another parameter and we can give it an object. And in this case, what we're going to give it is the coordinates that we get. So I'm going to move this player send message after we've worked out the world position, like so. And I'm going to give it that world position. So if I run this again, and I click, you'll see I am now getting these coordinates. So now it's good to see I've got debug information of where my player is moving to. And this is something that you can do for yourself when testing things in your games. The next thing we're going to do some looking at, and I'm first going to comment out this code, is we're going to look at some very, very simple physics in 2D. Now, there are a lot of interesting things that you can do with the physics, and we might not necessarily go through everything, but hopefully I can give you a good idea of the basics. And if you do want to go more into detail with physics, let me know, and I'll cover it in more detail in another session. So you do, you do remember when I created sprites, I added in some sprites for the world. So let's just quickly start by looking at those. Okay, in the sprite sheet, I didn't mean to open that. In the sprite sheet, I want to set it to multiple once again, and I'm going to keep these as 70 by 70, as that's what their size is, and I'm gonna quickly make myself some sprites. I want one of those, and I'm not going to be too precise with these things, I'm just making a few separate sprites. All right, there we go, apply, and I can close. So first things first, we're gonna make prefabs of these. So we'll need to make new sprites. I'm gonna switch back to the 2D view. For anyone that doesn't know how to do that, I switch between 2D and 3D by clicking this. So if you ever happen to lose the, the 2D or 3D view, that's where you go. So I'm going to call this wall 1, and I'm going to give it a sprite. So let's just go over here, and I'm going to make another one, and it's a sprite. I'm going to call it wall 2, and let's go, I said sprite, let's just keep it to 2, two separate objects. Now what I need to do for physics is I need to make these solid objects. So if I go to this object, what I need to do is I need to go component physics to do uh, 2D and I need to give it a collider. If it doesn't have a collider, the game doesn't know the Unity game does not know how it should try to stop when it hits that object with the physics. So these are very nice when working with squares, you can just add a box collider but you can do things like polygons, so more complex shapes, and these two just need box colliders. So I've given them box colliders, I'm gonna make them into prefabs. All right, so let's just add a prefab and another prefab. Now for the player to work, what we need to do is we need to add in physics components. Now, the first thing the player does is he has a box collider, so we'll do the same thing where we go component physics 2D box collider to add a box collider component. And you can go and change this box collider's size. Um, you'll see here I can make it a one for instance to round it off to unit sizes, that kind of thing. Um, we'll just leave it at what it is by default and we'll add the other physics components. So if I run this now, you'll see there's no special behavior in the game. If I click, I, however, can no longer move because I commented out the code. So I just wanted to be clear that that was a big distinguishment, is I'm not moving the, the object by clicking. If I go and add in a rigid body 2D 
to this object now and I run it again you'll see it immediately starts falling now the reason that that stopped there is a little bit unclear to me okay I've paused and it shows that it's on the object ah these are at a different Z level so let's just change them should be on zero 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 all right so if I run it now the sprites will line up correctly and the player fell so that's very nice I didn't have to do anything at all and it managed to see that it was standing on object now if I was doing this without physics I would have to do this collision checking myself and this can become a lot more difficult um, so I would recommend if possible when you think of your game idea to build something that can use the simple 2D physics and there are many other strategies that we can employ to build this physics the exact way that we want so let's just continue taking a look at the physics and what we're going to do is adjust our code once more so I'm going back to my Visual Studio project and I'm going to go back to this mouse code so this mouse code I'm going to still keep all of the, the world positions, all that kind of thing. But instead of translating, I'm going to use physics. So I'm going to use the rigid body. So the rigid body is what moves this object in the, 3D, uh, in the 3D world, though it's 2D. So we're going to say var rigid body is equal to the player dot get component, and the type that we want is rigid body 2d and the reason we use the 2d object is just because we're working with 2d physics and to move this we need to add force so we're going to say rigid body dot add force and this is going to add force at its origin equal to whatever velocity we want so I'm going to use the world pause minus the player transform position but I'm going to show you something very important about the physics part. So I'm going to say normalized, which gives us a vector of length 1, and I'm going to run this. So if we run this, and I click and hold, you'll see the player isn't moving. But if I go like this to the sides, you'll see it twitches a bit. Now, the default force that's applied at one unit is got to do with physics units. So it's not going to be the same one unit distance that we were working with when we translated. So what we need to do is we need to have some sort of actual distance. So I'm going to just multiply this by a thousand quickly for the purpose of showing this off. So if I click, it's going to launch the player directly up and I'm going to launch it back down quickly and there we go. And that gives enough force to actually move the object. So with physics you need to understand the objects have weight and certain amounts of force will be needed to move specific objects. So I've just changed that from a thousand to ten and you see if I click and hold it adds enough force that the player can move around. It's not quite the, the amount of input that we want but it's enough to show what we want to do. So when you work with the rigid bodies, you're going to do a lot of force additions, but there are many other fu uh, functions that are available to you. You can add, for instance, the force at a specific position. So this will change where the force is applied. This can do things like cause objects to spin and so on. The other thing is you can directly add torque. So this is rotation. And there are a whole bunch of other things that the rigid body adds that will be useful to you. So if you make it kinematic, it'll mean it's a, an object that can move, uh, move its parts independently. Sorry, my throat's a bit dry. This is the, the extent of what we're going to touch on for the actual controlling of physics objects, but we can go into more detail next week on this. So I'm just going to take a moment to take a look at the different physics collision types. So I'm going to go to this wall and remove the box collider and take a look at the others. So if we go component physics 2D circle collider you'll see, let me zoom in here, I've got this little green circle here 
that'll be the actual circle and this you'll change the radius so you might want it to be exactly one unit for instance then if we take a look at the edge collider you'll see it's a single line which we can probably move around no we can't but that's alright and let's remove that and then the last one is the polygon so th this is the the major colliders that we're going to use and when we work with the polygon we need a physics 2d material so we're going to go create physics 2d material if you double click on this and drag it onto something there we go we've got our new physics 2d material and what we need to do for this is we need to just give it a run quickly and make sure it's still working so you'll see our player object can stand on it and all it did was it automatically tried to work out the shape of the object so it's very nice and easy to use and it's very useful there's two more things that I'm going to touch on today and I'm sorry that the session started late but the first thing is lighting so when we want to do lighting in 2d there are two very simple things that we need to do so the first thing is we're going to go to our prefabs and we need to change this material so the default material does not handle lighting and there are many different options to you for doing lighting but what you do is you right click in your project explorer you create a new material and you give it a shader so the shader that I'm going to use is specular I believe that's what I used before lighting incorrectly and what we're going to do is we're going to change the material over here to this lighting sprite All right? and there are some other changes that you might need to do but by setting it to lighting sprite you'll see everything goes dark now if we want to light these objects we can add in default game objects so here I'm gonna go create other and I'm gonna create a point light and I'm gonna put that over here and I'm going to set its Z to minus one uh, so see these are all still in the right layer and I'm going to make it radius of four if I run it it should now be lighting these if I got my material correctly and the answer is no the material should be not diffuse not decal sorry I'm just trying to remember exactly which one it was I'm gonna go look at my other unity project and open project I'm just doing this to save some time quickly if we take a look at our light material it is shader sprite diffuse there we go so let me just go back no open project concept to complete okay so if we were here it's sprite diffuse there we go so you can see here already I've got some lighting on those two objects but what I want to do is I want to make it slightly more interesting I can change the different light colors so I'm gonna make that one pinkish and I'm gonna make another light to finish off the, the examples of the light and another point light and let's move it over here and I'm gonna make this a blue light so one cool thing about lighting is basic lighting is available for free in unity and it's something that you can play around with to get some really cool effects already this has added a kind of depth to the game that it didn't have before very very last thing for today is we're just going to look more at some of the GUI commands so I'm going back here 
So when you want to do GUI commands, you need to use this on GUI function. Now, a lot of the GUI options that you have, you can call using GUI dot. And you can see I've got a bunch of things. So you can at your leisure go up and down these things, but there are a few fundamental ones that we'll probably use, especially early on in development. The first one is a button, and you'll see, if I zoom in here, that it returns a bool. So if you click the button, this bool that it returns will be true. So you can give it a position, just like what we did before. So you give it a rectangle and GUI content. This can just be text. So my button. And if we're going to want to call a function or something, we'll put it in a statement. So button was clicked. We're going to say call me function and we're going to just say this dot transform dot position. Okay, I'm going to remove the call from the player control script quickly just so it's only called from here. And the rectangle can be 100, 0, 100, 100. I just want to run it and show you. So the buttons in Unity GUI aren't particularly nice, but if I click it, you can see immediately, even though the player is moving because of my other things, it updates with the player's position. Okay. The next thing that we're probably going to potentially use, depending on what kind of game you make, is you might use your GUI.text field. So a text field is something that the player can edit. So we're going to go GUI dot text field and a new rectangle and let's make this 200, 0, 200 or 100, 200, just give it a slightly bigger size and this returns a string. I think I need a default value. String text is nothing. There we go. And here I'm going to say var str is equal to that and this will give me whatever I type in there. And I'm going to change the call me function to take in a string. And I'm going to take the function out of there and give it the string. I know there, that this is kind of a pointless example, but just to show you how you can get the string back out. So I'm going to type something here. And it's not updating. Um, that's awkward. Should be text field. Text field, text area. I'm pretty sure it shouldn't be text area because that shouldn't be changeable. No. Um, I can't think of what I'm missing from the text code at the moment. Have there been any questions so far? And let's just go over here to check if anyone's typing. There's no typing. All right. So if I head back here, I'm just going to do one last thing. I'm going to change the GUI styles. So on my call me mono behavior, what you can do is you can create public function, public functions and objects. I'm going to make a public GUI style, my style, and I'm going to make it a new GUI style. So if I go back to my Unity editor, and this is on my player object, you'll see I have this my style object, so over here. So this came under my call me script. Now there's a bunch of very interesting properties that we've got here. So let me just zoom in. You've got normal style, hover style, active style, whether it's focused. You can set textures and colors. I'm going to keep this very simple. I'm just going to make the normal text color red. And I'm going to go back into my script over here. And where I'm showing this text area, my text, I'm going to give it a GUI style. So my style. Now within the editor I can change the UI 
at runtime and such things. So there you go, you can see, I don't know if you can see, but there you go, it's in red. All I did was set a GUI style and gave it to the GUI call. So these are the major things that we're going to leverage when building games. So that covers the, the actual content for the session in terms of the Unity 2D features we want to cover. Does anybody have any further questions or specific things that they'd like to see? Uh, okay, Christian's typing. Good for you. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys for participating. The video will probably only go up tomorrow. But if you do have questions, please go to the Facebook group and post them. And I hope this was informative for you guys. Unity is like Blender and Warhammer. Or War Warhammer. I don't know what Warhammer is for Half-Life. Hammer editor, perhaps? The Half-Life map creator. I'm sure it's just called Hammer. <laughs> but yeah, it, it is very similar. There's a lot of really cool things you can do in terms of game development. Okay, cool. <laughs> Next week's session will be on uh, designing the games that we want to build. So we're going to take ideas and work out a minimum viable product and an actual game concept that each one of the people taking part can build. And hopefully by the next call, you guys will have built something and tried something yourself. You're welcome to start on some game ideas in the meantime, but hopefully this has been something that can help you get started. Thank you for attending. Sorry for the, the delays once again.